Here we are with our Sunday School lesson for Sunday, August the 27th. And it's the last in our summer series, the last in this quarterly, and we'll start with a new quarterly next week. The title of the lesson is The Tragedy of Judas. The purpose statement is to look for God's help in dealing with the guilt that haunts us. And there's no question that this story, this story of betrayal, is one of the most gut-wrenching in the Bible. We know it. We've heard it. I would dare say that anybody that's ever been to Sunday school can, can tell you the story of Judas. Judas is a name that no one has called their child ever since. It's a story that's so disturbing because it forces us to answer the question, if we would, or more importantly, if we have ever betrayed the Lord with our actions and our thoughts. And it's one of those things that on, on its surface we can say, well, I would never sell the Lord out. No, I would never do that. And yet there are so many other levels that we, we do. When we look back at our lives, there are times that we have done things that, that have certainly disappointed the Lord and in effect have sold the Lord out because of some action or maybe it's just some thought that we've had. William Barclay, who I, I often refer to as a theologian that I like to go to, I look at his commentary, N.T. writes another one, Barclay describes the, the scene, and I think yeah, that, it's important, and I wanted to share that because I thought it was also fascinating. He says, if you look at the seating arrangement of the meal, of the Last Supper, that, that we refer to it, it's during Passover, the Jews did not sit at a table, they reclined, and the table was a low, solid block, and it had couches around it, and it was shaped like a U, and the place of the host was in the center. And they reclined on their left side. And just think about that a second. So, so they're, they're, they're not sitting at a table like we typically would sit at. And, and they're reclining. They're resting on their left elbow because that gives them the ability then to use their right hand to deal with the food. Now sitting in such a way, a man's head was literally in the breast of the person reclining on his left. So Jesus would be sitting in the place of the host at the center of the single side of the low table. The disciple whom Jesus loved most, we read this in, in the Bible in our passages, the disciple whom Jesus loved most must have been sitting on his right, for as he leaned over on his elbow, his head was on Jesus' breast. Now, there's theologians that, that argue about who the actual disciple that Jesus loved best was, but I think that most theological experts will agree that it was John. But it's the place of Judas that is real fascinating in this particular scene. It's quite clear that Jesus could speak to him privately without the others hearing anything. And if that's so, there's only one place Judas could have been. He must have been on Jesus' left, so that just as Jesus, John's head was on Jesus' breast, Jesus' head was on Judas's. And the revealing thing about that is this place on the left of the host was the place of highest honor. So it was kept for the most intimate friend. Now, when the meal began, Jesus must have said to Judas, Judas, come and sit beside me tonight. I want especially to talk to you. This very inviting of Judas to that particular seat was an appeal on the part of Jesus. Now, Barclay goes on to point out that there's more to this story, this, this scene. For the host to offer the guest a special tidbit, a special morsel from the dish, was again a sign of special friendship. You, you may remember the story when Boaz wanted to show how much he, he honored Ruth. He invited her to come and to dip a morsel of bread into the wine. So when Jesus handed the morsel to Judas, again it was a mark of special affection. And we also think it's important as we reflect on this that, that as the disciples heard this, they weren't moved, they didn't have any response in words, because that's surely something that Jesus had done in the past. He must have had this habit of doing this, and, and, and it, so it didn't seem like anything unusual. Judas had always been picked for special affection. Now I'm going to read the passage, and it comes from John 13. I'm going to actually read a little bit more into it, uh, or a little further into the passage, because we're going to talk about that also. 
So we start with 1321. After he said these things, Jesus was deeply disturbed and testified, I assure you, one of you will betray me. His disciples looked at each other, confused about which of them he was talking about. One of the disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, was at Jesus' side. Simon Peter nodded at him to get him to ask Jesus who he was talking about. Leaning back toward Jesus, this disciple asked, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It's the one to whom I will give this piece of bread once I have dipped it into the bowl. Then he dipped the piece of bread and gave it to Judas, Simon Iscariot's son. So after Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. Jesus told him, What are you about to do? Do quickly. No one sitting at the table understood why Jesus said this to him. Some thought that since Judas kept the money bag, Jesus told him, Go, buy what we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So when Judas took the bread, he left immediately, and it was night. Now I'm going to read on just a little bit because I think it's going to be important as we look at this passage. When Judas was gone, Jesus said, Now the human one has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify the human one in himself and will glorify him immediately. Little children, I'm with you for a little while longer. You will look for me. But just as I told the Jewish leaders, I also tell you now where I'm going. You can't come. I give you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. So you also must love each other. This is how everyone will know that you are my disciples when you love each other. Simon Peter said to Jesus, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered, where am I going? You can't follow me now, but you will follow me later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I'll give up my life for you. Jesus replied, will you give up your life for me? I assure you that you will deny me three times before the rooster crows. Now again, that, that, it's, it's familiar to us. But... And what I wanted to do in reading the rest of that passage was to bring in one other character that betrayed Jesus at the end of Jesus' ministry. Judas was going to betray Jesus by selling him out. We sell, Judas, we sell Jesus out in our lives when we don't do what he has commanded us to do. I mean, we're all disciples. He's counting on us. We talk about that when he ascended. He left his work to us. And yet, do we always do what he asks us to do? Jesus commands us to witness to others. He commands us to help the needy, to help the less fortunate. He commands us to love others and to show our love. He commands us to love the Lord with everything that we have. He commands us to share the gospel message with other people, not just keep it in ourselves. And he commands us to be faithful to the Lord. And we sell Jesus out by the way we act sometimes. I mean, think about a few very simple ways to look at it. On Sunday morning, do we go to church or we find some other activity to go to? Do we take time when we have time, when we can allot time, do we go visit other people, people that, that, that maybe just need a visit, they just need for somebody to spend a little bit of time with them? Visiting shut-ins is a form of ministry. It's a wonderful form of ministry. I think about the number of people who are, are shut in at home or possibly in a nursing home, and they sit there every day just hoping a friendly face will walk in, somebody they hadn't seen in a while that they can share a story with. Jesus, Judas was sopping bread with the Lord. It was a very personal moment. Simon Peter asked Jesus, who is going to betray him? And Simon Peter, later on, when we look at the story in the, start of, uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, he, he gets out a sword, and, and he says he will kill anyone that tries to betray Jesus. Simon was very eager to be outspoken. He was very eager to correct someone else's problem. But when he did that, he was also not recognizing his own sin toward the Lord and Savior. Isn't that like us sometimes, my friends? Don't we sometimes use the Bible as a sword to quote a scripture or to quote something out of the Bible to correct somebody else's fault? But when we do that, when we use those words, we sometimes need to consider the fact that we may be stabbing ourselves. 
You know, I want to remind you of Jesus' words in Matthew 7, to take the plank out of your own eye first, and then you can remove the splinter in somebody else's eye. Later in the same chapter, Jesus foretold his sin by denying that Peter would, would deny him three times before the cock crowed. God sees our sin on the same level as everyone else's sin. Sin is sin in the eyes of the Lord. And there's only one way of forgiveness, and that's through the blood of Jesus Christ. And we know that. Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Peter denied Christ with his lips. And how did they react? How did they react when they realized what they had done? Judas killed himself. He couldn't live with the regret. He couldn't live with what he had done. Peter, we read, wept bitterly. But then Peter realized what he had done, and he realized that he needed to go on and preach the gospel of the Lord. We've read in the past, I think it was a few weeks ago in our Sunday school lesson, that on the day of Pentecost, over 3,000 people were saved because of Peter's message. God does not want you to break off fellowship with Him. When we sin against Him, He wants us to come back and ask for forgiveness and then keep on going for the Lord. We can be like Judas. We can kill ourselves. We can kill ourselves by killing relationships with other people. We can kill our relationship with Jesus. We can be so upset by something that happened or something that we did or something that, that we think somebody else did that we, we kill off our relationship with our church family. We, we kill off our relationship with each other. Or we can be like Peter. We can get up, we can ask for forgiveness, and we can keep going. Peter received the reassurance from Jesus. Jesus reinstated Peter. He received encouragement from the other disciples. It's so important as people of faith that we need to rely on each other. That when somebody has done something, when they've stumbled, when they've fallen, we need to be encouragers for them to get up and to keep going. This treachery of Judas is seen at its worst. He must have been the perfect actor and the same time the perfect hypocrite. One thing's clear. If the other disciples had had any clue, had they even begun to understand what Judas was about to do, he would have never left that room alive. All the time, Judas must have been putting on an incredible act of love and loyalty, which deceived everyone around him. He was not only a villain, but he was a hypocrite. And sometimes I think when we look back at ourselves, we can deceive other people by our outward actions, but there's no hiding things from the eyes of Christ. There's a great tragedy here, my friends, in this lesson. Again and again, Jesus appealed to Judas's dark heart. And again and again, Judas remained unmoved. Billy Graham, I often quote Billy Graham, I talk about Billy Graham, I, I think about his words, and I, I watch some of his, his sermons on, on YouTube now. And Billy Graham once stated that the worst problem in the world was the human heart. He went on to say that sometimes not even God can heal a closed mind and a hard heart. So this tragic drama played itself out to the end. Again and again, Jesus showed his affection to Judas. And again and again, Jesus tried to save him from what he was planning to do. Barclay describes it this way, Then the crucial moment came, the moment when the love of Jesus admitted defeat. Judas, he said, hurry on what you propose to do. There was no point in further delay. Why carry on this useless appeal in the mounting tension? If it was to be done, it would better, be better done quickly. And still the disciples did not see or understand. They thought Judas was being dispatched to make the arrangements for the feast. It was always a custom at the Passover that those who shared also shared with others who didn't have as much. So the disciples thought that Jesus was sending Judas out to give the usual present to the poor that they too might be enabled to celebrate the Passover. When Judas received the morsel, our lesson says the devil entered into him. Satan can take the most beautiful situation and twist it for his purposes. Judas went out, and it was night. It is always night when a man goes from Christ to follow his own purposes. 
It is always night when a man listens to the call of evil rather than the summons of good. It is always night when hate puts out the light of love. It is always night when a man turns his back on Jesus. My friends, when we submit ourselves to Christ, we walk in the light. If we turn our back on him, we go into the dark. The way of light and the way of dark are set before us each and every day. We have a choice. We have a choice when we get up each and every morning to make a decision about what that day is going to be like. God has given us wisdom. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago to choose wisely if we listen to Him. Will you pray with me, my friends? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this message. It's so disturbing. It's so, it, 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 it just tears at our, our very fabric when we think about the times that, that maybe nothing is as horrible as Judas did, but the times that we have disappointed Christ, the times we've done things, we've thought things that were inappropriate and we disappointed Christ. We just ask that each and every day that you give us, that as we awake, as we look upon the opportunities in the new day, you do keep us aware of those things you want us to see. You, you keep us listening to the things you want us to hear and keep our hearts overflowing with the love, the love that you have commanded to share with others. And no matter how much of it we give away, you will give us more to give. In his name we pray. Amen. I love you, my friends, and I look forward to seeing you again soon.